Okay, so today we're going to talk about the digestive system, and from here on out till the end of the semester, I'm going to be going over the notes as I have them printed out. So you might want to print those out so you can follow along. Um, tw chapter 24 is on the digestive system, and we'll cover half of the digestive system today, and then we'll cover half of digestive system in another video. So the digestive system is both the digestive tract plus the accessory organs. Now, sometimes you might hear the digestive tract talked about as the alimentary canal or the GI tract, but the digestive system includes both the tract and the accessory organs. We talked about the digestive tract in, the, in general a &P. We started in the oral cavity. The oral cavity led into the pharynx. Another name for the pharynx is the throat, which led into the esophagus, that led into the stomach, that led into the small intestine, that led into the large intestine, then into the rectum, and then into the anus. So it's really just one big muscular tube. And along the way, there are some accessory structures that are going to secrete things into this long tube. So for instance, in the oral cavity, the salivary glands are going to secrete their secretions into the oral cavity. And then into the uh, small intestine, we have the liver and the pancreas and the gallbladder secreting into the small intestine. So those are the accessory structures. And in addition to that, we'll hear about some other accessory structures in the mouth like the tongue and the um, teeth and a couple other accessory structures like that. So let's look at the functions of the digestive system. And first of all, the first function is ingestion. Uh, that is just bringing food into the mouth. And then we have mechanical digestion. And mechanical digestion is um, where you're actually physically ripping and tearing and churning the food apart. And then propulsion is where you're moving the food down through the tract because food will always be moving from the mouth all the way down to the anus. So there's different structures that help with mechanical digestion. In the mouth, we have teeth that tear and mash. There's the tongue that compress and squash. There's the stomach and the intestines that swirl and mix and churn. And then another function is chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is where chemicals are going to break down the, the, the larger molecules into smaller molecules. And so you'll have to know that um, proteins get broken down into amino acids, and then amino acids can be absorbed. And polysaccharides, which are the polymer for um, complex sugars, um, they can get broken down into the monosacchar uh, monosaccharides, which are simple sugars. And then the simple sugars can be absorbed. And then triglycerides get absorbed, and they're kind of unique. Uh, large lipids break down into triglycerides. Triglycerides then get absorbed, uh, and then they're going to form chylomicrons. So we'll talk about that later in the chapter. Okay, um, and then in the body, once the triglycerides in the body uh, are in the body, they can be stored or they can be broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. Another function of the digestive tract is secretion. So secretion is when things are being released into the digestive tract. So if this were the digestive tract over here, okay, and we had um, like the pancreas, that's an organ that secretes into, the pancreas can secrete things into the digestive tract. And we also have things like the liver, right, and the gallbladder. And so those things can secrete things into the digestive tract. So secretion means that we are, um, substances are moving from these other organs and into the digestive tract. The substances that can be secreted are water and acids and enzymes, buffers and salts, and we're going to learn all about those different secretions. We'll learn about the different organs that are doing the secretions and what the secretions do. Another uh, function of the digestive tract is absorption. And now or absorption is when substances move from the lumen of the GI tract into the body. 
So that's going to be going in the opposite direction then. And so um, there's two different places where things will get absorbed into. They have to go through several different layers, but eventually they're going to absorb into the blood or they're going to absorb into the lymphatics. Okay, so one way or the other, they're going to get into the body. And so absorption means that um, when you eat things and you have nutrients inside your GI tract, those nutrients will get absorbed into the lymphatics or into the blood. But think about all the layers they have to cross. They have to cross the, all the four layers. There's four layers of the GI tract here. Uh, and then they have to get through the interstitial fluid. And then they have to get through the, um, the lining of the blood vessels or the lining of the lymphatics. And then eventually they get into either the blood or the lymphatics. But that's what absorption is. It's, it's absorbing things into the body. And then the last um, function is defecation. And defecation is the elimination of wastes from the body. So um, the things that don't get absorbed are going to stay in the GI tract. And they're going to mix with um, secretions. Um, and then the GI tract will dehydrate them and compact them and uh, make them into feces. And then feces will get it ejected through the anus. Okay, um, there's some other functions of the lining of the GI tract, and that's mostly just protection. So protection against the digestive acids and enzymes that the GI tract is producing protection against mechanical stresses such as abrasions as those um, fibers and proteins and um, substances come through the GI tract. They're kind of tough on the walls of the digestive tract. Uh, and oh yes, and then also the digestive tract protects against bacteria. Uh, so there's a layer we're going to look at called the lamina propria, and the lamina propria contains macrophages that engulf pathogens. So uh, before we get into some of the specifics of the functions, let's talk about the peritoneum. The peritoneum is a serous membrane that encompasses many of the organs in the abdominal pelvic area. And so we call that area surrounded by the peritoneum the peritoneal cavity. And remember, with any serous membrane, we have two layers. The innermost layer is called the visceral peritoneum, and that covers the individual organs. So it's covering the liver and the stomach and the small intestine and the large intestine, and it's adhered very closely to those organs. The parietal peritoneum, on the other hand, uh, lines the body wall, and so it, it is not lining, um, it's not going around each of the individual organs. And the parietal peritoneum secretes that peritoneal fluid. The fluid is in between the two layers so that um, when the organs are moving and churning and um, contracting, uh, they are able to do so without a lot of friction. In uh, liver disease or kidney disease or heart failure, sometimes a buildup of fluid can occur in the cavity. Uh, this is known as ascites. And it, when you get a lot of fluid in there, it's a very distinct look. You can see you know, a bulging out of the abdominal cavity, right? Uh, so it's a very distinct look. It distorts organs. It can cause heartburn and indigestion and low back pain. The mesenteries are double sheets of peritoneum that connect both the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum. So when we look at the next page, we're going to see some pictures of these and you'll get a better idea of what they look like. But um, the mesenteries connect the parietal and the visceral peritoneum. Okay. Between the layers of the mesenteries is an areolar tissue. And in that areolar tissue are a lot of blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatics. So these mesenteries kind of provide routes to and from the GI tract to the rest of the body. 
The other thing the mesenteries do is they stabilize the positions of the organs and they prevent the intestines from becoming entangled. They keep the intestines in place because they're very long. The small intestines are 20 feet long. Um, the large intestine is in a very distinct pattern with an ascending transverse and descending uh, position. And so the mesenteries really help to stabilize those positions nicely. The ventral mesenteries, um, we don't see a lot in adulthood, but um, we do see the lesser omentum in adulthood. And the lesser omentum is on top of the stomach and it connects the liver to the stomach. It kind of helps to stabilize the stomach position. Um, and again, because there's areolar tissue and there's arteries and, and veins and um, nerves in there, it provides a route to the liver for blood vessels. Uh, there's also another ventral mesentery that remains in adulthood, which is called the falciform ligament. And we'll see this too on the picture. It's found between the liver and the anterior abdominal wall. And it helps to stabilize the liver, the position of the liver. The dorsal mesentery um, we have in adulthood. And uh, the, it, the dorsal mesentery forms an enormous pouch it hangs like an apron. Uh, we call it a fatty apron sometimes. If um, people gain weight, a lot of times they gain weight in the um, adipose cells that are in the areolar tissue, and that contributes to this beer belly look. Uh, the dorsal mesentery helps to provide padding and protection, and because there's so many uh, triglycerides in those adipose cells, it helps to um, be an energy reserve and it also helps to insulate the body. Then we have mesentery proper, and mesentery proper is found in the small intestine, about all of the small intestine pretty much, except for maybe 10 inches of it, uh, and it locks the small intestine and the pancreas in place. The mesentery proper is retroperitoneal, and there's several organs actually that are retroperitoneal, I have an acronym to share with you to describe which organs are retroperitoneal, and we'll also go over that. So the mesentery proper is retroperitoneal because most of the small intestine and the pancreas are behind the peritoneum. The last mesentery that I want to talk about is called the mesocolon, and the mesocolon is associated with the large intestine. It's, it's holding the ascending and descending colon in place as well as the rectum. Uh, it's not holding the um, transverse or the sigmoid colon in place. It's just um, the ascending, descending, and rectum that it's holding in place. Okay, so here's a picture, a drawing that you guys can print out if you want to. It's just showing uh, that this right here is the lesser omentum. It's the mesentery that's connecting the stomach to the liver, kind of um, holding that stomach in place down here. And it's been cut, so you can see that the edge of that has been cut. This right here is the greater omentum. It's hanging down from the stomach, uh, from that posterior or the um, inferior edge of the stomach and it's called the greater omentum and this is the one that ends up it's cut but it usually hangs low and it it loops back around and it's called the fatty apron so when people are um, gaining when they gain that abdominal weight uh, that's fat within on the inside of that uh, Greater omentum is where those adipose cells are stretching and growing. Then if we look down here a little lower, we see um, this is the mesentery proper. The mesentery proper is what's holding the small intestine in place. So you can see the fibers up here, and you can see the fiber, the red fibers down here, and they're just holding that small intestine in place. And then we can also see this right here, and that is called the mesocolon. And the mesocolon is holding the large intestine in place. So that's those blue lines there um, that are coming down like this. Okay, that's the mesocolon. Okay, then when we look at this picture, 
You'll see a picture like this in your book too. Um, first of all, we'll look at a couple of structures here. These, I want you to get a, an idea of what we're looking at here. We're looking at the cross section of many of the, the organs. So uh, when we look at the organs here, we can see um, this up here, this is the liver, right? So that's a cross section of the liver. Um, right here we have the stomach. Right here we have the transverse colon, so that's part of the large intestine. And then we have a whole bunch of um, small intestine cross sections. That's pretty long so we can see it. And then um, those, all of those uh, organs are inside the parietal peritoneum. So the parietal peritoneum is this blue line that I have that you can see all the way around. That is the um, parietal peritoneum. I'm gonna do it in a little thicker, I think, here. Try to do it here. So this is the parietal peritoneum going all the way around, right? So it, it doesn't really, it stays on the outside of the, of the cavity. It doesn't go inside at all. Right, and then, um, so that is your um, parietal peritoneum, okay? Then in red, I have, the, um, I have the visceral peritoneum. So now we're looking at, let's see, go a little smaller here. Okay, so now around each one of the organs, you see this red line that I've drawn in. That red line then, um, that is showing you what the visceral peritoneum is doing. It, it's covering each individual organ. So it covers it pretty closely. And then in between those, you have these green lines here and these are those um, mesentery. And the mesentery connect the red and the blue lines. So it's connecting the parietal peritoneum to the um, visceral peritoneum. Now there's a couple of organs that we see out here that are not inside that blue lining, right? So we've got a couple here. See, that goes all the way down like that, like that. So there's a couple organs that are not inside the parietal peritoneum. This organ right here is not. That one is called the pancreas. Uh, then we have um, part right, an organ right here that is, is the duodenum. And then if you look a little bit lower down here, we have the uterus and the urinary bladder and then the rectum. So all of those organs are retroperitoneal. There is a mnemonic that you can use. Uh, you do need to know which organs are considered retroperitoneal. So the mnemonic is SAD, pucker. Okay, so the S stands for suprarenal glands. The suprarenal, supra means above, renal means kidney, okay? The gland that's above the kidneys is the adrenal gland. The aorta and the inferior vena cava are retroperitoneal. The duodenum is retroperitoneal, um, the second and third parts. The pancreas is retroperitoneal, so is the ureters, so is the colon and the kidneys and the esophagus and the rectum. Those organs are all retroperitoneal. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the four layers of the GI tract. Uh, we have the, um, and you've heard of this before in general a &P, the innermost layer is called the mucosa, then we have the submucosa, then the muscular layer, and then the serosa. So we're gonna talk about each one of these layers, and uh, I'm gonna show you a picture uh, as we go. So uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at that picture then, and you can follow along in your notes. And I'll follow along in my notes as well, but I'm gonna show you this on a picture instead. Okay, so there are four layers of the GI tract. The innermost layer is called the mucosal layer. And then we have the submucosal layer, which is the next layer. So it's kind of showing you like this innermost part here, that's the mucosal layer. And then the next uh, little um, more superficial one is the submucosal layer. Then we have the muscular layer and the muscular layer is made up of two layers of muscles. 
and then we have the serosa. And so the serosa is the outermost layer. So I do want to go through each one of those um, specific layers and tell you what they do. Um, and so this is just like the, this is the GI tract in general, and um, the lining of the GI tract is going to vary by region. So in the small intestine, for example, you have these circular folds, which is shown here, right, on the inside. But then, um, and then there's villi on top of those circular folds that increase the surface area. But in the stomach area, you're going to have long, longer longitudinal folds that are called rugae, and they disappear as the stomach fills. So this is like the, the GI tract in general. So let's start by looking at the mucosal layer, okay? The mucosal layer is a mucous epithelium. And so it has glands, it has epithelium, and it has a couple of different layers. So we're going to take a look at this. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a circular fold up here, which you can see these are these um, folds that are folding inside the lumen of the digestive tract. And I am going to show you what that looks like close up. So this is a picture of it close up. So this whole thing right here is the circular fold. And so we're just looking at the mucosal layer because the mucosal layer is, um, makes up that circular fold. So in the mucosal layer, we have epithelium. That's one layer of the mucosal uh, layer. We have the lamina propria, which is just a little bit deeper. And then we have the muscularis mucosa, which is the deepest layer. And then on the inside of that circular fold, we have arteries, uh, an artery, a vein, and a lymphatic vessel that can absorb whatever uh, is on the inside of that intestine that can get through those uh, epithelial cells. So um, let's talk about the mucosal epithelium. Okay, So the mucosal epithelium is going to be different in different areas of the digestive tract. For instance, in the oral cavity, so in the mouth, that mucosal epithelium is going to be made out of stratified squamous. Stratified squamous is multiple layers of flat cells. It's very protective, it's very um, sturdy. And so all the friction of saliva and food and your teeth and your tongue up against it uh, will slough off the top layer of the stratified squamous, but it's still thick enough and there's a regenerating layer on the bottom that will help to regenerate those cells. Then in the stomach, though, we have simple columnar cells. And we know that simple columnar cells typically have microvilli on top of them. Um, these simple columnar cells are uh, also adapted to produce mucus. So they are also called mucus cells. And they can produce mucus in the stomach area to help uh, protect the lining of the stomach. In the intestines, the mucosal layer will be made of simple columnar cells as well but those cells will be called goblet cells. And those goblet cells are specialized to secrete enzymes. So we can see that the, in all the layers, in all the different segments of the GI tract, we have the mucosal epithelium as the super, most superficial layer of the um, mucosal layer. But they have different cells and they have different functions in different areas. So scattered in between these simple columnar cells in the stomach and the small intestine, and even in most of the large intestine, are these cells that are called enteroendocrine cells. So as the name implied, entero means intestinal, and endocrine means hormones. So these cells will secrete hormones that can help to coordinate the GI tract and coordinate when the accessory organs are going to secrete and to coordinate uh, motility of the GI tract. The epithelium takes quite a beating, and so they have stem cells that will regenerate and replace the cells that are dying off and being um, mechanically removed by the substances within the intestines. The epithelial cells need to be constantly replaced and repaired through mitosis. Sometimes, though, when uh, patients go through radiation and anti-cancer drugs, uh, those drugs inhibit mitosis, which means those lost cells won't be replaced then. And this can lead to problems of absorbing nutrients because 
the mucosal epithelium um, that are simple columnar. Remember, they are cells that have microvilli on top that help to increase their surface area. And so they're um, helping to increase surface area so more things can be absorbed. There's more surface area where things can be absorbed. Well, if the chemotherapy is damaging those uh, epithelial cells, then they're not going to be able to absorb the nutrients like they should. Then the next deeper layer is called the lamina propria. The lamina propria is made up of areolar tissue. The lamina propria in the stomach and in the intestine contain secretory cells and they will secrete things like histamine. So we're gonna hear about how the lamina propria releases histamine. Then we have the deepest layer, which is called the muscularis mucosa. And that deepest layer is made up of a narrow sheet of smooth muscle and elastic fibers. So the smooth muscle is uh, in two layers. These two layers can alter the shape of the lumen, and so they aid in propelling the nutrients from the lumen into the submucosal layer. The submucosal layer is a dense irregular connective tissue. It binds the mucosa to the muscular layer. So inside the submucosal layer, we have these blood vessels. We have the arteries and veins and lymphatic vessels in the submucosal layer. The submucosal layer extends up into that circular fold. The submucosal layer also contains exocrine glands that will secrete buffers and enzymes into the lumen of the intestines. The muscular layer is dominated by smooth muscle and there are two layers of smooth muscle. One is a circular and the other is longitudinal. So I know we talked about this muscularis mucosa, that's part of the mucosal layer, and now we're talking about a muscular layer. This is a thicker group of muscles, and they're gonna have uh, a different function. And whereas the muscular mucosa tried to, tries to propel the nutrients into the submucosal layer, the muscular layer is going to help to move the substances um, through the GI tract toward the anus. The smooth muscles of the muscular layer are controlled by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is our rest and digest nervous system. It will increase the tone and activity and will cause the muscles in that muscular layer to contract. And the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight nervous system and will decrease the muscle tone and activity of the muscular layer in the digestive tract. Then the last layer that we have is called the serosal layer, the serosa. The serosa is a serous membrane, so it's the, it's the same thing as the visceral peritoneum that covers the muscular layer. It's found along most parts of the GI tract, and where there is no serosa, the tract is covered by collagen fibers. The visceral smooth muscle of the muscular layer contain pace setter cells that depolarize spontaneously, kind of like what we saw in the heart. And this depolarization triggers waves of contractions that spread throughout the entire muscular sheet. This spontaneous depolarization causes a rhythmic squeezing and so um, there's two different types of um, contractions. One is called peristalsis and the other is called segmentation. In peristalsis, that is where the contractions will move the bolus of food down towards the anus. So um, this is peristalsis is what we're gonna talk about right here. Um, it's the propulsion or the movement of material from one segment to the next. So here we see different segments of circular muscles, right? So we see all of these um, segments here. Okay, there's a segment, there's a segment, here's a segment, here's a segment, okay? And so what we're seeing here is the bolus of food, which I have right here, and you're seeing that the muscles uh, in the band behind the bolus of food contracts, it squeezes, and it pushes that bolus of food forward towards 
the anus. That's called peristalsis, and that will move food uh, and substances towards the anus. For this to occur, the smooth muscle behind the bolus have to contract and the smooth muscle in front of the bolus have to relax. There's another type of contraction that's called segmentation. And segmentation is when a bolus of food is going to be churned in between two segments of the GI tract. In order for this to happen, the band of smooth muscle behind the bolus will contract at the same time that the band in front of the bolus is relaxing. Then quickly, the band in front will contract while the band behind will relax. And so this causes a churning of that bolus back and forth inside this segment, and it will be uh, helped to mechanically break it down. And we call that segmentation. The digestive functions are regulated by three things, local factors, neural factors, and hormonal mechanisms. We're going to start by looking at local factors. Local factors are triggers that will cause the epithelium and the layers of the uh, digestive tract to respond without nerves or hormones being involved. So some of the triggers are pH. If the pH goes up or goes down, uh, the digestive tract will respond locally. And then chemical composition of whatever is inside the GI tract. Uh, is there carbs in there, fats in there, proteins in there? Another trigger is stretch. The GI tract is going to respond to stretch. For example, stretching of the intestine can cause the smooth muscle in the intestine to start contracting, and that will increase motility right there where that bolus of food is and right there where that digestive tract is being stretched. Another example is in the lamina propria that I told you about. The lamina propria is one of the layers in the mucosa, and histamine will be released from the lamina propria to stimulate acid secretion. Next, we have neural factors. There are sensory receptors in the walls of the GI tract that can trigger peristaltic movements, but these sensory receptors are only going to trigger very short peristaltic movements, and so food will just move only a few centimeters. And the food, again, we call a bolus. Then there's also a whole plexus of nerves in the GI tract, which is called the myenteric plexus. The myenteric plexus contains those parasympathetic neurons that are going to increase the motility of the digestive tract when they're stimulated, and they also contain the sympathetic neurons uh, that are going to decrease the movements and the motility of the digestive tract. Since these are part of the autonomic nervous system and therefore they are part of the central nervous system, we say that when the sympathetic neurons and the parasympathetic neurons are doing the controlling, they're part of a long reflex. The commands coming from the sympathetic neurons and the parasympathetic neurons are coming from the brain. So they're coming from quite farther away. The myenteric plexus also contains neurons for local reflexes without the control of the central nervous system. We call these short reflexes. So the short reflexes are within the enteric nervous system, and they involve small segments of the GI tract. When a bolus enters, it triggers a local peristalsis and digestive secretions. The enteric nervous system has as many neurons as the spinal cord and as many neurotransmitters as the brain. The last way that the GI tract is regulated is through hormonal regulation. And in hormonal regulation, there are digestive hormones that can either enhance or they can diminish the sensitivity of the smooth muscles. The hormones are produced by enteroendocrine cells, which I told you were cells that were in between those simple columnar cells in the GI tract. And those hormones that are produced by those enteroendocrine cells are released into the blood, and then they travel a very short distance to reach their digestive organs. Okay, so that's it for this video, and the next time we start, we're going to talk about the oral cavity, the pharynx, the esophagus, and the stomach.